Welcome to the Morelli End. My name's Mark Machado. I'm joined uh, by my cousin Dominic uh, from across the pond, the professor of cricketology. Uh, we are here to have a preview of New Zealand's white ball tour. I'm going to say I'm going to say we're going to preview the the ODI series and the and the T20 series mainly because, and I think this is going to be something I'm going to have to talk about early on. I think there's only two T20 matches, and yeah. which I kind of don't for. We'll go into this in a few moments. Uh, before we get into it, though, a quick bit of housekeeping. First, if you haven't done so, join the Murley End WhatsApp channel. We put stuff in there as and when um, stuff pops up in kind of news-wise uh, in, in the Strunk and Cricket world. Uh, we, we put bits and pieces into that. And also sign up for a newsletter. We haven't written um, on it for a couple of weeks, but we're getting back onto it. Dom's got lots of great content planned. Nick Brooks has got lots of great content planned. Estelle's got a lot of great bits and pieces she wants to write up as well. Um, and I might even have a stab at something in, in the future. Who who knows? Who knows? Um, and if you need a mortgage, Mike Ward Mortgages. He does mortgages in the UK, in the UAE, and in Saudi Arabia. Get in touch with him and mention Morally End. Also, I should add, we are actively looking for other sponsors as well. If you want to, if you want to come on board and sponsor the show, sponsor a tour um, or the newsletter or something, drop us a message, leave us a comment, and uh, we can chat about our various packages that we have. If you want, um, anyway, Dom White Ball Series New Zealand. We here not too long ago since they left. Um, they've gone and, uh, well, had the time of their lives in India. If you want to know more about that, by the way, you can listen to Kumbhale Corner, which is our yeah. kind of India India show on the uh, same channel as Murali End. Um, New Zealand are back, though, Dominic. It's a kind of... It's quite a different squad. The most contrasting thing between our squad and their squad might be that they've decided to, to rest some of their test players. Yeah. I mean, so let's see. They're resting Southie, resting Latham. Um, they're resting, let's see, Devin Conway, Rachin Ravindra, uh, Daryl Mitchell, Kane Williamson. Uh, Mitch Santner is the person who is captaining the squad. So it's a totally different looking squad for New Zealand in terms of their ODIs and T20s. I guess it makes sense to some degree uh, because they're looking to blood new players. Um, they have an older side in terms of their, their white ball setup, um, and they want to kind of try new and different things. They, I think they also just want to give some new players a go. Um, so I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, this is New Zealand's B team. But a lot of these players, I'll, I'll confess, I'm, I'm not quite familiar with their, with their game. So we don't know whether how good they will be um, and what they'll be able to do. But there are plenty of good players still here. Santner, Bracewell, Chapman, um, Ish Sodi, uh, Will Young, who played a who, who played a magnificent knock in India. Glenn Phillips is there, uh, Lockie Ferguson. So there's no lack of talent on this New Zealand side, but a very, very, very different side than the one that just defeated India and came to our shores not too long before. Yeah, it's... Um... If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Uh, the the thing that might might have dragged you in, if you're new to us, if you just found us, firstly, welcome on board, um, and do leave your comments and tell us how wrong we are. We don't we don't mind that as long as it is they they're not hateful. Say what you like about or say what you want about what we say. Um, our previous episode that we did was about Sanajaya Surya and his tenure thus far. Um, this episode, I think, really, we're going to title it for for the purposes of of, of YouTube. It's going to be about whether or not we've got our test uh, our squad selection right or wrong, because Sri Lanka have done the total opposite. Sri Lanka are third in the in the table uh, for for the race to that London game, mm. and our kind of three of our kind of key test players, I I are in this squad. And I'm gonna suggest they're gonna be expected to play full roles. That's Patam, Kaminda, and Asita. The the biggest concern, of course, is Asita Fernando, right? Because and Kusil Mendes, we you know, and, four sorry, out and of the Kus- yeah, yeah, four out of the eleven. Um, 
So kind of, I'm going to say the biggest concern is Sasita because, firstly, the other three we expect to be multi-format players. You know, we know that Kussel and Patam are as effective at opening the baton at T20 cricket as anywhere else is in the world, any other opening partnership. So it's not totally surprising that they're in here in this squad. Um, but we do know the last few years, we've had huge problems trying to get our fast bowlers fit at the time when we've needed them the most. We're off to South Africa in a few weeks to play yep. what's now actually become a massively crucial uh, two fixtures for us if we are to get to that London game. I mean, off the bat, what do you make of that decision, Dom? Yeah, it's it, it's a strange one, right? Um, and then we also didn't mention Dinesh Chandamal is in the squad, in the T20 squad too. Um, and as we saw in the previous series, he did not play any of the games. Yeah. And my thought here is you have a 17 person T20 squad. Surely you could just send Asita and, and Chandi over to South Africa, right? And let them get warmed up with Angelo and Prabath and everybody else who's going over there at this time. It really doesn't make any sense. And for me, Asita, he's a great bowler, don't get me wrong, but at least in terms of T20s, I think he should be at best our fifth choice. You know, we have Nuan Tushara, we have Matisha Paturana, we have Dilshan Madushanka, we have Lahiru Kumara. Let's set aside Dushmanta Chamira because I don't know anything about his injury status at the moment. Um, we have Eshan Malinga, who showed himself to be a great talent in this emerging T20 uh, World Cup. So it's really surprising, given the depth of fast bowling that we have, that Asita is the man who is chosen for this, when he could go and be preparing for something else that that's how i view it but do you agree mark so 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 basically yeah i do the only two things are right the the kind of counter argument to all of this is that cricketers exist to play cricket and they want to play cricket they want to play as much cricket as possible um Asita fernando's 27 he's not you know, in his early 20s, he would say that his body's fully developed in terms of he does possibly doesn't feel like he needs to manage his workload. Um, I, I don't think this is necessarily about the questions of, uh, about, you know, how committed these these guys are to the team because clearly they're committed um, to it. I think it's more about trying to get the, the best out of them. And he might say, actually, me playing as much cricket as possible in competitive cricket, regardless almost of the format, is the way to get the best out of him. That's what he might be arguing. I'm not sure what is what what his opinion about this is. I also think it's difficult for your player to ever say, no, I don't want to play. Mm. Um as, you know, especially when, you know, I'm not saying twenty seven is is as I just said, it's not the early twenties, but at that at this point and with the amount of competition for places that Sri Lanka have, you mm. might be thinking, I want to make sure by that time, you know, the next T20 World Cup's at home, I want to make sure that I'm up there in consideration for it, right? Mm. Um, the 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 other, like, the other thing is, is that Sri Lanka exists to win cricket games, right? And you want, they want to, they want to treat every game as, as, as if it's as important as every other game. And I think, part of the problem might be is that actually as you know we are not typical of the casual cricket fan right the casual cricket fan probably tunes in or starts to pay attention kind of five or six overs into it right and they want to see Sri Lanka win and want to have their best team out and that might be the consideration of the people doing the selecting over here I think though overall in the grand scheme of things, you got to think. I know Sri Lanka have a. I, I'm going to say they kind of have a decent-ish record compared to other South Asian sides in in South Africa. But going over and getting results in South Africa is going to be yeah. really tough. Suddenly, this this um, race to the London game was absolutely lit up, hasn't it? We it felt like going into you know when when New Zealand left Sri Lanka after Sri Lanka beat them two 0 It kind of felt like well, there's really kind of two teams in it Sri Lanka are hoping we're there 
were just off, off possibly yeah. just off the pace. If and the, the the kind of advantage we thought we had was that India was going to Australia, so we thought there was a chance that maybe one of these two teams could knock the other one out. And then if we got to kind of the end of January, beginning of February, and Sri Lanka, or after the the Border Gavaskar Trophy, and Sri Lanka was could still be in and about the race, and Australia yeah. with Australia to come over, we thought maybe, 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 maybe. Now New Zealand have gone and blown the doors off the whole thing, and suddenly it's a five horse race. Um, it's tremendously exciting, right? Like, how cool yeah. is that to have all these teams? especially teams that have kind of, you know, three teams like South Africa, um, Sri Lanka, and New Zealand, who kind of been ignored as quality test sides, right? Like they're not given the five test series. They don't have a permanent fixture like every year around the holiday time to, to let them in. And now they've made these series coming up, the Border Gavaskar Trophy, when Sri Lanka, when Australia come to Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka, South Africa series, those are all high pressure moments, right? Those are all going to be big time games. Um, but as you said, right, it's not easy to win in South Africa. We have a good record. But um, last time we were there, which was not 2019, I think it was 2021, um, we had a rough go of it. We got swept 2-0. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, South Africa's bowlers are excellent. I mean, Kagiso Rabada looks like he's back to his all-time best. And that is a very, very scary kind of sight. Um, South Africa, their one weakness, I would say, is their their batting lineup. They don't have like a, a sort of powerhouse batter who can kind of carry them through the innings. But their bowling lineup can give any team troubles, right? And the ability to take 20 wickets is there. So... You know, I think one of the things to go back to is, right, we obviously want our players to get used to South African conditions, to adapt to South African conditions. But we also want to make sure our best 11 is out there fit and healthy, right? Uh, and someone like Asitha, does he really need those three or four overs in the T20 match to... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think I agree that, you know, if he plays both games, he gets eight overs, then he could potentially bowl another 30 yeah. in, the, in the ODI matches. I'm not sure. I know this is going against what Upal Tharunga said where they were talking. Oh, no, he said actually there are no concerns over the, the ODI championship table or whatever. I can't, I don't even know what they're calling that at the yeah. moment, right? Um The ODI, the next time Sri Lanka play meaningful ODI games in terms of going to a World Cup is what? three years away that's a long long yeah way and away. they're that... decently well positioned you know they're they're yeah sixth in the world rankings at the moment um top eight automatically make it in plus the host so it's really top nine because south africa you figure is going to be yeah. in that group um you know i i think i think and i don't think when you look at the squad you're thinking it, it's not like we're we're telling prime malinga Okay, go off and don't play these matches. Asita is a good bolt. Like whatever we think of him, like I don't think anyone could reasonably say like he's a game-breaking one-day bowler. He's a good one-day bowler. You can see his value, but we also have a ton of other people who can fill that role pretty well and, and do a comparable job. Um, I, I I I can all I think about is that first test in Manchester. Yeah. where they just had that kind of warm-up game a few days beforehand, the week beforehand. The the warm-up game was a total disaster. And in Manchester, they were, what, three down yeah, uh, for not very on. much, very, yeah. very early on. And it took the bowlers really to to get to the middle of Lords, the second test, before they kind of got got some stride and kind of figured figured out how, to, how, how the conditions over here worked, right? But I think... What we want to do is make sure that doesn't happen because if we've done that, if that happens again, if that repeats itself in South Africa, then we're, we're probably out the out the running. I'd say if we lose these two two matches, yeah. then we're we're it makes it much harder. It makes it a lot lot harder. Um, yeah. The other the the other thing, I guess, two things I would add is that one, this is only a two match series, right? So that means that there's only you know. They're, if you throw the first game, you've got to be ready for that second game, right? If something goes bad the first game, the second game is a must-must win. So you want to come up as strongly as possible in that first match. The other thing I would mention is, like, because we play fewer 
test matches, right? We have these smaller series. Each game matters more. Like India yeah. and Australia, because they have those slightly longer series, like the percentage percentage wise, right? If they lose a game, it doesn't affect them as much as it does if we drop one of our matches. Uh, if this was if this was a more general cricket show, I would say because of that very fact, it's absolutely unbelievable that England who played nineteen games, yeah, I think we should in six. Mm-hmm. Um, in that table because also they've got the, this incredible home advantage as well, which actually Sri Lanka are, have been kind of masters of manipulating, right? Yeah. Um, when it when it comes to that World Test Championship. Um, to bring it back to the this kind of white ball series, though, what, and I kind of said, what is the point of the ODIs? What is the yeah. point of two, two T20 games, right? Because mm. effectively you, you're going to know what the result is or who, or who could win it by the end of the first game, right? You like, yeah. Anything less than three seems to me to be utterly pointless. Have, have I, am I wrong in my thinking here? Or, yeah, I'm not really sure what the math is or how they calculate it because why wouldn't they play a third game? Just have a third decider game. Maybe there's something about New Zealand's tours that they have to be back in time for something. So I don't know exactly what went down, but like, I would much rather have a third um t20 or even like a fourth t20 and then just two odi games yeah Um, given that one the world cup is coming more quickly for the for t20 and is going to be in sri lanka um so yeah i'm a bit confused about that and then it's because it's a two-game series it's even more awkward that you have someone like dinesh chandamal just in the squad for the t20 series and then he's just going to go fly over like two days later to South Africa. I think I think the the kind of justification is is a he's been in the squad now for quite a while in the T Twenty yeah. squad, um, and and secondly, I think we know uh, that the management are quite keen to have senior players around, yeah. right? So and obviously he's he's one of our our most senior players, so I think that's that might be the reason. But I agree. I just think we want to get as many of our Test eleven as yeah. you possibly can. I mean. I think there's a good argument of basically why is Kaminda in this side? Why is he in this squad? Because he bats yep. quite low down. I'm not saying he shouldn't be in the World Cup eleven, if and when not if when that rolls round. But I just think he could probably miss these two um, T20 games and and this ODI series. Mark, you're and just go get acclimatized. I I 100% agree. So right, like let's just look at our composition of the squad, right, and who they played in those T20 um, T20s against West Indies, right, um, and the top order, right. So the top order was um, Kusal, right. Kusal was the was Kusal, Potham, KJP, Kamindu came in at four, Charith at five, Bonica at six. Hasaranga, Wella, Dikshana, Patirana, Dushara, right? So you're already batting Bonica at six. Like you very easily could move him up to four and have Chamindu come in and bat at six, right? You have an yeah. extra polling option or bat at seven, wherever you want to put him in the squad. You could move Wella up the order. You could say, hey, you want a chance to bat at the top of the order? Um, try it out. There are a plethora of left-handed batting options in the Sri Lankan lineup, and that's something that I think you know we will discuss. That you could absolutely say, okay, come into like we're not dropping you. We just want you to go and get ready for this. And then in the ODI squad, as you mentioned, he's been batting at seven and eight, and there's absolutely no reason. I that- I think I think Sri Lanka, the only team in the world, the only major cricket playing team in the world that aren't managing their their players and giving them breaks and we just expect our best players to play in all the games or as much cricket as we could possibly throw at them which a you know I'll, I'll, I'll admit as a fan I, I on one level I enjoy that but B I just think this is a, this is a unique opportunity we've got to mm-hmm. to try and do something when do you remember just before in this kind of what I call the semi-finals of the last um, test championship where yeah. Sri Lanka went to New Zealand and they actually took I think two or three weeks before they left 
to go and train in, in Sri Lanka in an area where the conditions were as similar yeah, yeah, as yeah, they yeah, could yeah. be in New Zealand. And we hit that first test and we were absolutely superb in it. We didn't get the win, but we were as competitive as yeah. we'd ever been in the test match in New Zealand, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of mental focus and, and preparation that I was hoping we might see from it. And I think actually it's quite a surprise to a lot of people because when you hear the senior players talk, they're talking a lot about the potential to get to that final. They're, they're obviously quite keen to do it, right? Yeah. So I'm and, a and bit I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't happened. And Mark, I think this is the... There's two things I think we have to consider. So one is, right, like, there's the priority. To me, the priority is, hey, we have a real chance to be in this World Test Championship to make a mark, to do something no Sri Lankan team has ever done before, right? Um, and we we do have a good squad. We have a, a very talented squad, a squad that's capable of winning in different conditions, that has dynamic players, that has experience, that has youth, all that stuff. And what we'd like to see is them maximize for that, right? And here, I think they're trying to maximize for these T20 and ODI games that in the long run, don't have that much meaning. Yeah. Right? And the the other part about it is even if we say, okay, well, we want Sri Lanka to do well in the short run in these white ball games, I think they have a talented enough squad. They have enough, enough depth where they don't lose that much by switching players out. Agreed. Uh, Right? Like you you look at the squad, there first it's 17 people, which I think is a little bit excessive for a two game yeah. 20 series, right? Um like and I we say and you, we know, you know, uh Apotaranga talks about or has talked about giving kind of bringing, you know, some of the reserve players in. Yeah. As well. Not not as in giving them a chance, but having them around the squad, like Ishan Malingo and, and people like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I will say one huge positive for me is Again, the depth of talent that we have, because we are sending an A squad over to Pakistan right now as well. So there's going to be two series. There's going to be a uh, a four day series in Pakistan um, for the A squad, and then a one day series. And you look at the squads, right? Um, you have Pasindu Surya Bandara, right, who's act- averaging like over sixty in first class cricket. Oshada Fernando, Pavan Ratnayaka, Sonal Danusha, Ahan Wickremesinghe. Right, uh, Monuja Sahan, Wishwa Fernando's going over there to get some game time. Isitha Vijasundra, right? Um, Nisala Thiraka, Janora Kalupahana. There's again a ton of talent around this squad. This is a very talented team. We have like 20, 30 players who I really feel like are capable of playing at this very high level of cricket. Um, and I'm glad that they're getting a time. So at least it's not like, okay, here is the 17 or 16 who are in the squad and those guys are not playing. They're at least going over to Pakistan and getting some crucial international experience. So I will say that is one positive. Uh, yeah. And also on, t- on top of that, I think we should also say that it's just amazing that we're having this conversation, right? Like mm-hmm. Shrunk has got so many talented players. Um, yeah. The fact that this is a selection headache is, is, is kind of great, right? It's, it's a selection headache in a good Kind it's of a in good a good way, right? Because it's like players are playing too much cricket. We think there's players that come in, that are come, that could come in and do a job, and also we're in contention to get to finals and stuff like that. That's exactly yeah. these are exactly the kind of conversations that we want to be having at this point in the cricket yeah. world. And I, I want to, I, I just want to bring in. Do you think some of these players resisted mm. the temptation to go to South Africa earlier? because they wanted to make sure they had showcased all their abilities as much as possible before that IPL auction? That's a great question. Um, the big bag is very tempting. And, and you know, look, look, look it's, it's, life, it's life-changing amounts of money, right? Yeah, I mean, like, look at Patarana, right? He's He's got the equivalent, I think, of 1.6 US dollar, a million US dollars. Like he is the, now the, like that is the richest IPL contract that any Sri Lankan has ever gotten. Um, I mean, yes, I think that's true that maybe Patham and Kamindu and Kusal are thinking, hey, this is a chance to secure an IPL contract. But Dinesh Chandamal, 
that's like I think there's marginal differences, right? Like you could argue about Potham, Kamindu, and Kusala, and I wouldn't be upset if you so, said. So, so, so actually, bro, I'd like. When we now kind of talk this out, I think Chandamal being there isn't that big a deal in a way because it's basically he's going to end up going to South Africa two days later. There's days still later. quite yeah, a lot yeah, of time yeah. Yeah. when yeah. he when he gets there, right? It's it's the other guys who are involved in both the squads yeah. that you're like this is probably slightly unnecessary. I think you could probably argue the case for keeping Patham and Kussel. Actually, yeah. that said, I mean Kussel became such a point of discussion around the the England series and around until until he until the New Zealand series we start to get runs. You know, don't forget in the three tests over here, he didn't score runs in the first one. He got dropped in the second one. He kind of comes back in to fill fill um because of Chandy's injury basically in the in the third one. Then he gets yeah. moved down the order and scores loads of runs against New Zealand, which is obviously brilliant and exactly what we wanted yeah. to do. But they talked all the way through this about working with him to 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 make him a an effective batter at test cricket surely yeah. he's one of those players that needs the work to become that you know he needs to be recalibrated potentially to get the most out of him for test cricket i right. look I, I'm, I'm saying these things i don't know if that's, i mean if you that's could also say the same thing about potham right like it's his yeah. first tour to south africa right like he's going to see pace and bounce that he's not seen really in his cricketing career and he's doing that as an opener, right? That's not, that's not an easy adjustment to go from playing, you know, in Dambala to right to, to South Africa in a matter of weeks. Right. Um, I think, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of questions, but I, I think we should state like, especially after the last podcast, one of the things that we, why we discuss Sanath Jayasuriya so much is because we believe in the talent of the players that we have in the squad. We have, as Mark said, right, we're knocking on the door of a, a final. We have players who are wanted all around the world for their white ball skills. We have players who have developed rapidly over the last three or four years and shown themselves deeply adaptable to the game. And we have the makings of a special squad. So what we're arguing about is how do we wring the most out of that yeah, Lemon, refinement. Right? We're talking about refinement, right? Like, We're not you talking to, about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, if you if you're watching this, if you watch the previous show, then you need to think of us as kind of sitting in a paddock around a Formula yeah. One car, trying to figure out how to get that extra half percentile out of a car, right? Yeah. And make them into a, a good winning team, and and I think you know we all accept that it might be a reasonable argument that teaching these guys how to win is an important part of that, right? Yeah, it's just. There's other things as well. Um, should we? So, so Mark, should we talk a little bit about what does your optimal T twenty eleven look like for this squad? Like, let's not let's not say okay, let's um, you know we would put this guy in or this guy would go travel, knowing that these are the seventeen guys. Who would you play and what kind of pitches would you like to see? Um. You see, I think the pitch is well. It's interesting, right? Because we were recording this on Friday, well, Friday night in or Friday evening in the UK, Friday afternoon in New York, in New York, and Friday night in Sri Lanka. The reports we're hearing is a lot of rain in Dambala, which means, you know, some people have told me today they're not sure there'll be actual any any play tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know what that means to the pitches in terms of what kind of. Nick, they'll be in. I expect they'll be not dissimilar to what we saw against the West Indies, right? And I suspect there probably won't be much change to, to the eleven um, yeah. if if it can be avoided for that we got the West Indies. I'm of the opinion that basically it's a bit like I think I'd like to see the, the thing I would like to see changed. Is almost Hasaranga batting higher up. I think that mm -hmm. was an that was an experiment that kind of f potentially kind of failed at the World Cup, but it yeah. was never there was the sample size was too small. They um, never gave it the full like you know two games isn't really enough to decide whether yeah. Florida is going to work right. Like if he's if he's meant to be our Glenn Maxwell, then the thing that Australia did with Glenn Maxwell is they back the big show. And a, like, and it's yep. not gonna, it's it's not gonna show up every game. And we talked about this. We talked about this extensively 
uh, when we talked about the T20 team, but when it it's gonna it's gonna perform. This T20 side, the way it's composed, it's full of if like it, it it's total just big hitters, right? You yep. know that if he plays KJP and Barnaka and and all, all the boys are in, kind of were. It's kind of designed that you're expecting just two or three of them in any given innings to come off, right? That yep. that's the thing. At some point, it will points it will collapse as well, and at some points they're going to go. At some at some point they're going to go and smash a, and that's totally a high two hundreds, right? Yeah. That that's and that that's the we have to be willing to live with that. Even the best sides in the world will have those collapses because to play good T twenty cricket, you got to be aggressive from the get go, and and I think. One thing that's been proven is that, in fact, teams are too cautious with their wickets. And um, if you're going to go have seven, eight batters who can really bat in your side, there's absolutely no reason to hold back, yeah. right? And we just need a couple guys to to um, go off. I think another thing, and I read this interesting piece um, about finishers, right? Uh, one of the tricky bits about finishers is finishers aren't really like it's not really oh they bat six seven eight right because in ODIs you can predict when they come in. There's a lot more variance in T20s. So the finisher is whoever happens to be there, and it actually turns out that the guys who are the most effective finishers are the players who come in at four and five and are aggressive. Yeah. So I think in five we have Charath in like a really good spot. And then you think someone like Hasaranga could play a, a, a game change in innings if every once every while you said, once in a while you said, okay, let's bring him in at four and see what he does. And he comes in, smashes it about, and you know maybe once every six, seven games he scores a seventy or or whatever, and that's going to totally change the game. And especially if you have the batting to back him up, right? If you have the KJPs and the Bonicas there, you don't have to be worried about. Went into wasting a wicket. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you that he should bat higher up. Uh, I tend to think they're playing maybe one batter too many, but that that might just be me. Yeah, I think the thing is, is that at home, if you've got these kind of, I'm going to say slower pitches, you can kind of weigh with it because so many of our yep. batters bowl. So um, and you know. Kaminda and Charith potentially could give you eight overs, right? So I think it's it's kind of fine. I think it might be one of those things that we need to to address when we play away from home. I mean, the thing we kind of, I think the big discussion point around this eleven should be, you know, what is Chamindy's role in this squad? Is it to get prepared for the point where we need we go away to places where we need to play? Uh, a seeming all rounder, which is effectively basically everywhere apart from South India yeah. and Bangladesh and, and Sri Lanka, right? Or yeah. is it just to kind of you know be around the the environment and we hope for and pray that when he does need to play, that we can get the best out of him? I mean, if you're going to be brutal about it, that's what the strategy has been in the past, and at points it has worked. So, yeah, uh, I I um, think the other interesting thing is I was thinking about. You know, the, the name that always gets bandied about with Chamindu is that he's like Sri Lanka's Hardik Pandya. Yeah. And when India used Hardik Pandya, especially early in his career, they had him come in at six because yeah. they said, OK, he's our younger player. Like we need to give him if there's someone who should have balls to play in or can go all out aggressive. It should be that guy. Right. It should be that young, talented guy who should get his way to play in as opposed to, you know, coming in at eight and nine and having, you know, one or two balls to swipe at. And it's not, you know, not much of anything. So I think from the player development perspective, especially if you're going to bat deep, throw him in a little bit earlier. So personally, I hate compared to Lanka players to Indian players, right? Only because, yeah. especially when you, when you kind of compare someone like Chamindu, um, at the stage of his career that he's at compared to Hardik Pandya, right? right, for, right. For, for the main reason is, is I think the pressures on the Indian players and, the, and their route, route to the team is is kind of so titanically different. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, a, a lot of our um, kind of Sh Sri Lankan lads are... Pit it's pretty rare, 
I, I, there is a few examples in this squad, Nir and Tishra, for example, of where SLC and other people in and around choking cricket can't see a player coming through the system, right? Yeah. Um, where someone like Hardik is has kind like I just think the the system he has to battle through is totally different, mm-hmm. and also I think the pressure on the Indian players is just astronomically. Yeah, like yeah. As, it's, yeah. it's astronomical and therefore totally different as well. And where in Sri Lanka there isn't like you know we, we have a very strong side and a very strong squad, p- potentially the strongest squad we've ever had, the strongest depth of talent that we've ever had. But I think the the kind of pressures around it are, are so different and so removed. It's almost not worth like I think the comparisons are kind of a bit. I think it's for me. It's difficult to compare them, but yeah. maybe I'm being a bit precious about my little Sri Lankan boys. Oh, that's a yeah. weird phrase. I should have said that. <laughs> I think um, you know, move, moving away from that, like I do think that it depends on the player. I think certain players get laid in with more pressure. And there's more responsibility for those players to produce in certain moments. So you think of, um, you know. Crystal Mendes, Lahuriro Thiramana, if you're earmarked as that next guy, yeah. right? Like, then Avishka. there is that. Avishka is the Avishka. ultimate example of it, right? right? It comes in at, what, 18, 19. And, and just looks a million bucks, right? Yeah. and Yeah, after after his duck. <laughs> like, yeah, after, right. After Mitchell Stark, you know, he, yeah. that, that's his first delivery in, in one day cricket is uh, Mitchell Stark in swinging Yorker, mm-hmm. right? At, his, at the peak of his powers. But I think, you know, for me... Mm-hmm. It's about strategizing and thinking about how are these players going to combine with each other? How do we get the most out of them? And I think with someone like Chimindu, because that we, we've been very lucky. I'll just say we've been lucky over the last five years because we have a set of players who have grown of their own doing. Patham Nisanka being one of them, right? He has gone from strength to strength. Chara Thessalanka, Dikshana. Patirana, um, Thushara, uh, Tushara, right? They've all grown because they have this sort of understanding of how the game is changing, how the game is developing. I don't think we can usually expect that from players. No, like, no. You see, I reckon if I if, if someone from SLC was sitting here, they'd say, no, no, no. Like, we have coached them. We have brought the best. Uh, we've got the brain center. We have been looking at global trends. And, you know, and, and that's how they've kind of coming through the system. I said to, um, in our in our group chat, we were talking about which Lankan players might get picked up by the IPL. And I said, I reckon if Patton does get picked up, I wouldn't be surprised if by this time next year, he starts bowling off spin or something. Um, and I I think that it's a combination of, Shrunk have, like, they're exposed to a lot of coaching a lot of different types of coaching yeah but also i do think the modern cricketer and i don't think this is a particularly unique thing for Sri Lanka. i think you they've got to you're right they, they've got to develop themselves i do think that actually you can look at some players i won't mention names but you can look at some players in this squad who just rely too much on their talent and actually you think about where they were five years ago and you go they haven't really developed at all they haven't become better players at all and i think that they we've now if you if you're a shrunken player in that kind of group that you mentioned you've looked at the group of shrunken players that you grew up with from like say 10 years ago that were winning world cups and then you've looked at the group of shrunken players that came immediately after them and you just thought right why did that group not do what the previous group did and it's because Mm -hmm. they they just appeared to have no sort of professional development once they got the role right they were just happy to kind of be in and around the team I didn't think, but, oh, I need to get better think, at this. By just... But you think it's systematic, though? I think it's a systematic issue because you look at someone even like a Demuth, Karuna Ratne, right? Like someone who came up in this post-Sanga, post Mahela era, but massively improved his own game. Yeah. Um, amidst – and think about how many coaching changes, captain changes, all that stuff. Like we finally have the infrastructure where you could make the argument you just made, Mark, like – Okay, we have a youth setup. We have an under nineteen setup. We have an A team that's playing. Like I think now you can say that there's that support structure for those players to grow and develop, right? I think maybe three or four years ago you 
can't necessarily say it right like so, so like a so I, I i i think even though that structure is there right and i don't mm-hmm. think it's just you need to cricket i think this happens in all sport i think there has to be a the players have to not just buy into it but also think right how can i move this forward it's not just good enough to turn up to training every day yeah and listen to the coaches it's and then once they give you nutritional advice, it's not just good enough to do what you've always got to be looking for the the marginal gains, right? Like yeah. what's next? What's next? What what is what are my contemporaries around the world doing? What are my what are people in other sports doing? What yeah. are they doing in baseball that I can bring over to this? How are you know how are baseball hitters warming up to to hit home runs? How do, what can I learn from that? And I think that. There's definitely some players in the Shrunker squad who have kind of embraced that. And there's yeah. other players who are too reliant on, I will just listen to what my coach says. I think mm. it's, I think in within Shrunken culture, there is an element of listen to your elders and they will guide you to, yeah. to, to make you the best player you, you can be. But actually the kind of ultimate lesson has got to be that once you get to a certain stage, once you've played a bit of international cricket, yeah. you should know what areas of the game you need to improve in and how to right. improve in it and how to get more the most out of your body. If you look right. at, like, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm, the, the one person, the two people who come to mind are Djok- from outside of cricket are Djokovic and Ronaldo, right? Where they were always looking for that kind of marginal. And I'm not, firstly, I'm not saying I, I don't actually, I'm not a fan of either of those two players. I always never watch tennis. I think it's an abomination of a sport. Um, and obviously, Ronaldo has played for all the teams I despise the most. Um, but they are, you know, as professionals, I think there's a lot you can learn from it. Um, and I, because I think that we can talk about the system and how maybe the system wasn't necessarily always in place for shrunken players. But I think the best players have got to be the ones that kind of maximize everything the system has get everything out of the system and then look to move it forward again like i often right. think if i like was a, is a good example right you know yeah. like right obviously he had coaching but he you know he took every little smidgen of ability to improve that he could right um and and that's what we always hear about those stories um and he's kind of, he and malinga are, are he malinga and Murley are probably like the best examples of guys who obviously they were coached well, but they had this ability to transcend that coaching by being like, Oh, well, what's this guy doing? How do I do it better? What can I invent or do differently that nobody else is doing? That'll put me ahead. Um, Whereas, you know, for a long time, talent was good enough, right? Mahela always talks about, it was just, you know, he never changed his technique. He just went with, and and that's because he was a supremely gifted, supremely talented player who was going to make it regardless of whether he changed his technique or not. So I think there's this fine line here of, and I, I, I like your point about the cultural conservatism. You listen to your ayahs, you listen to your uncles, and you say, okay, I'm going to do what they say. And then I, at least people won't criticize me because I did what they said. But it's the inventors. It's the people who dare to go outside that, right? When everyone is telling Mahesh Sikshana, okay, you need to toss it up and bowl slowly. He says, you know what? I'm going to dart it in and bowl faster because that's what I've seen Sunil Narayan do. That's what I've yeah. seen Rashid Khan do, right? Um, Wella has also done the same thing. So that, that to me, I think, and I think maybe what we've got, come to now is a, a kind of differentiated model of, we need those players who are self-motivated and making the changes in their game. Uh, and I think we can see it at some level, and there are different degrees to it too, right? Obviously, Thikshana or Matisha Patirana are guys who are exceptional in that regard. But even someone like, I would say, Kusal Mendes has made clear improvements in his game. Um, and you can see he's taking different bits and pieces from other players. And like, does it always come off from him? No, but he's maybe not... Um, like, again, to compare it, someone like Bonica, right, supremely talented natural player, right? But you don't see him trying new or different things. It's just, does that talent come off on the day or not? And I think that's, I guess, the differentiation we're looking for is those guys who do that a little bit more. 
There's also things you can do to make sure that talent comes off in the day, and maybe he's doing them, and maybe he's not. That's a yep. discussion for that's a whole different discussion. I think that might be another ninety minute on a Monday night that we need to get yeah. into that. Yeah, um, yeah. Dom, sh- Dom, should we leave it there? I think we've just about covered every aspect of this. Definitely this the two, squad two selection, game, two, two game T twenty series. Yeah, the, um, the cutest T twenty series possible, right? Yeah. Do you want to mention? Uh, I'll briefly mention this, and we can t- pick it up more. KJP is back in the ODI squad. And what we and because uh, I guess one of the things we were talking about last time is how does the selection work? And I, I to be frank, I don't really understand how KJP can make it back into a ODI squad. Or even if you think he's a valuable player in the ODI setup, why in 2024, three years away from the World Cup and not give it another chance to a younger player, a Nishan Madushka, who... He obviously Nishan Madushka is in the squad, but like I would hope in the pecking order, Madushka is the guy who goes in instead of KJP. Let's see what happens. Um, this definitely something we're going to have to pick up at the end yeah. of this at the end of the ODI series um, and figure out who's who's playing when and and what and what is going on um, with some of it. Maybe. I mean, do you know what Schlunker loves nostalgia? Don't be surprised if you see KJP go to South Africa, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uncle's yeah. got an uncle. Um, yep. Dom, let's leave it there. If you got this far, hit that subscribe button. Leave us your comments. Tell us your thoughts. We love hearing it, and hit those likes as well. We've been Murali, and thank you for watching and listening. We'll be back in very, very soon. <laughs>